In our last episode, we completed a number of Railroad Radiant Quests. The Radiant Quests come at us at various times while working with the Railroad, and we'll likely complete them during the course of the primary Railroad plot. But one of the first things the Railroad asked us to do was to collect a prototype from the switchboard. We found that prototype in a safe back when we explored the switchboard with Deacon, and when we're ready, we can hand the prototype over to Dr. Carrington. Desdemona told me to give you this. An extraordinary feat to recover this, but that's hardly the point. Without a lick of training, and us knowing hardly anything about you, Des has invited you to join HQ. It would have been nice if she had consulted with her second-in-command, but what's done is done. <sighs> Since you're here now, we might as well put you to work. What, you don't think I can handle a dangerous job? The danger doesn't concern me. Your work at the switchboard proves you can deal with that. I just hope the mission doesn't require knowledge about synths and our procedures. Something you've had scant opportunity to learn. You guys recruited me. I don't need your attitude. Charming. I'm sure you and Glory will be fast friends. Cut to the chase. Tell me what you need, Doc. One of our field agents, Old Man Stockton, needs help with the runaway synth. H-222. So headquarters, as always, puts out the fires that others can't be bothered to put out themselves. The paranoid old bat won't even tell us the problem. He insists that we get our intel from a dead drop. What's a dead drop? Oh, shit. I knew I forgot to tell you about something. Oh, dear lord. A dead drop is a mailbox with a rail sign on it. It's a common means of communication for us, so keep an eye out for them. He may have a good reason to be paranoid. Perhaps he does. And maybe he did the other dozen times he's made our agents jump through these unnecessary hoops. So, is there anyone you like? What, Carrington? He's just dripping with charm. Yeah, people are lined up around the block to be his pal. Oh, I wasn't aware we were competing for congeniality awards. I thought we were rescuing since. My mistake. Sounds like an important mission. Anything involving Stockton is important. It is. After switchboard. We're so short-handed, I have little choice but to throw you into the deep end. When you make contact with Stockton, he won't give you the time of day unless you've given the proper countersign. The current sign is, do you have a Geiger counter? And the counter is, mine is in the shop. Please tell me Deacon taught you that at least. He taught me what I need to know, including that. It appears our resident pathological liar didn't completely neglect your training. Is all the security necessary? Often we're dealing with strangers. So we need to establish trust quickly. And despite our precautions, the Institute always manages to track us down. Got it. Or we could try to pass a charisma check to get on his good side. And this was one of the few charisma checks that I couldn't fail, even with console commands. You can trust me with this. I'll get it done. You sound rather convincing, actually. Stockton is a prominent businessman at Bunker Hill. The dead drop will be near there. Use the escape tunnel in the back to get there quicker. With that, we begin the quest, Boston After Dark. And man, this Dr. Carrington is quite the charming guy. After we get the quest, Dr. Carrington becomes a merchant. He doesn't like idle gossip. Any news out there, Doctor? Nothing that would interest you. Now, let's talk about you and your health. But he can heal us and sell us medical supplies. We now need to go and find a dead drop. We explored a number of dead drops in our last episode, but this one is not randomly generated. This one is always found in the same place. We find it by the water next to a blasted out car near Bunker Hill. And inside, we find Stockton's holotape. Update. Observed unusual activity has ceased. Window is open for a heavy to make contact, but they should act now. The package is still in my possession. It cannot remain here safely for much longer. Out. Oh, this old man Stockton sounds impatient and agitated. But now we know what he wants. He's got a package, a synth, and he's been holding on to this synth for too long. He needs to get rid of it, and we have to help him. Heading to Bunker Hill, if this is our first time here, we get approached by Kessler, and we have all of the same dialogue that we explored when we came here during my Institute playthrough. To find Old Man Stockton, we head to the covered marketplace, and we find him standing behind a counter next to a cooler. Welcome, my friend. 
Might I ask, do you have a Geiger counter? Now, we know the counter sign, but we could say something else to explore his other dialogue. Why do you ask? We're expecting a full shipment of Geiger counters shortly. Some scavenger found them in an abandoned vault. Come back later and perhaps you'll be able to purchase one of these life-saving devices. Uh, no, I don't have one. Then today may be your lucky day. We're expecting a full shipment shortly. Remember, what you don't know could kill you. I have a Geiger counter built into my Pip-Boy. What a fortunate soul you are. Never will you have to worry about walking into a hot spot unawares. If you're ever in the market to sell that handy device, please let me know. Or we can say the railroad counter sign. Mine is in the shop. You? I was expecting someone of the uh, feminine persuasion. Presumably he says that because he was expecting glory, but he has something different to say if our sole survivor is a woman. Mine is in the shop. You? I was expecting someone a bit more uh, armed. You're with our mutual friends, yes? That's right. It's always nice to make new friends. You're the one that needs help, right? Indeed I do. Yeah, I'm with the railroad. Perhaps you should lower your voice and choose your words with greater care. Or we can try to speak covertly. Let's say I am. Of course. You've just joined, haven't you? All you need to know is this is the first stop for all our new packages. So maintaining proper security here and preventing any unnecessary delays is crucial. You're talking about synths, right? Jesus. Yes, I am talking about synths. No one likes delays. Yeah, delays have a habit of creating all sorts of problems. It's bad for business. Why do all packages start here? If you don't know the answer to that already, I'm not certain I should tell you. We can try to pass a charisma check to get him to answer our question. And if we fail... I'm helping you out. The least you can do is answer my question. Let's just stick to business, shall we? But if we succeed... When a package leaves the manufacturer, they go to a specific location. The location changes, but for now, it's here. So if I'm compromised, the whole supply chain dries up. We must now pass an even more difficult charisma check. And if we fail... How do they know where to go? I think I've said too much already. But if we succeed... We have someone on the inside. He points them here. Why Patriot chose Bunker Hill, I'll never know. Who's Patriot? I think I've said too much already. Sounds like Bunker Hill's important. Arguably, it's the most important. You've got a tough job here. It requires a degree of finesse, but I am happy to do my part. Just tell me what you mean. This synth is fresh from the Institute. He's disoriented. He's never seen anything like our world. I can't hide him here forever. Or, instead of doing any of that, we can again speak covertly. A trader always has to move his merchandise sufficiently. And we're all about making good trade routes. Exactly. My current package has been in my possession far too long. I'm supposed to deliver the package to some place nearby. But raiders have complicated matters. So, if you could... If it's such a problem, why not just change the delivery site? The rendezvous site has worked for flawlessly many times. Introducing variables is always dangerous. So clearing out the raiders is overall safer than risking our package being intercepted by our competitors. So I'm just muscle. Other problems I can solve myself. But sometimes you need a hammer. So I just need to wipe out a few raiders. Done. <laughs> I like you already. And again, we find an option to speak covertly. Facilitate delivery. I can do that. We're supposed to make the delivery at night. So once you clear out the undesirables, we'll meet after the sun sets. 
By choosing the speak covertly options, we avoid disappointing Stockton and potentially angering our companion. And by speaking covertly, if Deacon is our companion, we have an opportunity to accumulate some affinity. But otherwise, it doesn't change the outcome of this quest. Stockton wants to meet again at nightfall. But first, we need to clear the way to make sure we can exchange the package safely. The location is an abandoned, ruined church nearby. And the church is filled with raiders. Raiders that harass anyone traveling the road outside. You know, ammo isn't cheap. <laughs> I won't shoot. Promise. With Trash Can Carla safe, we can loot the dead and then find a place to keep out of sight until nightfall. At dusk, Old Man Stockton arrives with the package. Mr. Stockton said I shouldn't say anything. Everything looks clear. This is H222. H2, here's the person I talked to you about. What sort of name is H-222? It's my designation. The Institute doesn't bother to name their property. Synths are just numbers and letters to them. There may be more raiders out there. We should make this quick. Quick? Got it. Nice to meet you, H-2. Another person actually happy to meet me. This'll take some getting used to. Remember what I told you, H-2. This isn't an ice cream social, Stockton. You're quite right. I'll fire up the signal. Old Man Stockton walks to a nearby lantern in the window and lights it. And there. Time for me to go. Keep H2 safe. Someone will be here shortly. With that, Old Man Stockton runs off. He is happy to be getting out of there. While we wait on this other person, we can talk with H2. Hey, H2. From what I've been told, it's probably safer if I don't say anything. I don't want to put you in any more danger. I understand. I'll leave you alone. Why not talk to me? I don't really know. But Mr. Stockton told me it's best for everyone. I don't think he was lying to me. I eat danger for breakfast. Tastes like chicken. Chicken? I'm sorry. I don't understand. But... I appreciate the thought. It's just that... You guys are all... Well, no one's ever stuck their neck out for me. I wanted to thank you. This world is overwhelming. But people like you make me feel better about coming here. I have a lot of questions, especially about the Institute. That's precisely what Mr. Stockton said I shouldn't talk about. At all. We can pass a charisma check to try and get him to talk about it. And if we fail... If I understand more about the Institute, I may be able to help you and others better. Listen, I don't want to cause any of you any more trouble than I already have. So I'll just hold my tongue. Thanks again. But if we succeed... I'm sorry. I don't know much about the Institute. I worked the maintenance tunnels. Every day for as long as I can remember. The only time I spoke to anyone was to acknowledge scientists' orders, and very rarely to other synths. I've talked more in the past few days than I have my entire life. But you know where the Institute is, right? Stockton already asked me that. I don't know. I really don't. He says no synths know. How... Or why that is, I can't say. How did you escape the Institute? The only thing I'll say is I had help. Sorry. It's the one thing I won't talk about. You worked with scientists? Yes. At least that's what we called them. My only interaction with them was to receive orders on what to clean. I would acknowledge my task and occasionally ask for necessary clarification, but... That's really it. What do you know about the rest of the Institute? I heard there was a concourse above the tunnels. It's huge and big and green with, with many synths. But they're watched more carefully by the scientists. 
Mr. Stockton said very few synths from that section ever escape. What's life like for a synth in the Institute? Synths are expected to behave like machines. You await instructions, you execute instructions, you perform basic self-maintenance. Anything else is considered defective. And then the SRB comes. You mentioned the SRB. They're the ones that watch us to make sure we're not defective. To make sure we don't run. Since that get noticed, just disappear. I don't know where they go. Goodbye, H2. Thank you. You have no idea how nice it is just to talk to someone. Yeah, yeah, enough of the sappiness. Well, of course. Well, take care. You're welcome. We do all of this to give you a better life. You really... You really have no idea how much I appreciate all of this. Soon we see a man in a leather jacket quickly approaching the church. Don't shoot. Wanderer, right? And my man Deacon, still with the same old face? What? It's been three whole months. You're getting slow. I keep meaning to go to the face doctor, but who has the time, right? I heard about you. Walked the Freedom Trail, cleared out Switchboard. Glad you joined the team. You here to pick up a package? Yeah, I'm, I'm here for the package. Speaking of which... Moonlight's burning. We have to go. I need a moment. It's nice to meet you. Honor's all mine. Let's take a look at our friend. Do you have a Geiger counter? Right you are. Mine is in the shop. All good? Now, let's take a look at our friend. Hey, you. You okay? A little rattled, but I've never been better. The other man, he said I shouldn't talk too much. He told you right, H2. You'll need a real name and a new face, but we'll get to that. Oh, listen. There's more than raiders behind me. Afraid we need a little more help. More raiders. Not a problem. You headquarter heavies mean business. You're supposed to take it from here. Too much activity on the route, and I ain't a heavy like you. What do you mean a new face? We gotta file off the serial numbers on new arrivals. Make it hard for the Institute to find them. Most sense going for a brand new set of memories as well. You know, for that extra protection and all. But first, we gotta get them to safety. What type of help? We need to get to Ticonderoga's safe house, my home. A lot of sense fresh off the boat crashed there until we smuggled them out of the Commonwealth. You do anything else there? Most of what we do is look after the new guys. They usually got a million questions, so I try and answer as best I can. We got some of our own questions, too, about the Institute and whatnot. Agents sometimes drop by to lay low if the bad guys are on their tail. Never a dull moment. Nice that you're willing to do that for us. Yeah. I'm working off sands from a misspent youth. Let's get this over with. All right. Ticonderoga, here we come. I'll lead the way. Where that high-rise runs off, we get some affinity with Deacon if we choose the option to use the railroad countersign. For all his joking around at the end of the day, Deacon likes to play things by the book. Also, one of the dialogue options we had back there was for Nate to say, this isn't an ice cream social, let's get a move on. Which is a really weird reference because first of all, in this post-apocalyptic universe, no one has ice cream socials. So this is clearly a pre-war reference that only someone from before the war would make. And secondly, it tells us that ice cream socials must have been a big thing in pre-war America, because our first reference to ice cream socials was in Fallout 3. During the Point Lookout DLC, we found a disaster relief outpost terminal, and in the terminal entry when they were talking about protecting yourself from the new plague, they said that one of the most common places for people to catch the new plague was during ice cream socials. Nate here is inadvertently telling us that before the war, ice cream socials happened a lot. They were commonplace. So yeah, perfect vectors for catching the new plague. High Rise leads us down the street. Eventually, we run into a small group of raiders. Keep your eye out for the rail signs. Besides the goodie bags, tourists and agents have left valuable intel. Oh gosh, yeah. This whole place is like a bad dream. At last, we arrive at a skyscraper, which must be Ticonderoga. And we're here, all in a night's work for you agent types. Huh. So, is this a normal operation? More than I'd like. Sometimes I can sneak our friends through all by my lonesome. But other times, it's like the damn raiders are holding a convention. Working with you made it a whole lot easier. I'm not here for chit-chat. To the point, then. I didn't sign up to babysit your ass. Sorry to impose, but hey, it's all our jobs to look after since, right? 
Just part of the service. I think I'm gonna like you even more than Glory. If you ever need grub, bullets, or just a power nap, take the elevator up to Tycon. My house is yours. And Deacon, try not to give the rookie too much shit. Deacon may be a terrible liar, but it always pays to have him on your side. Later. And with that, High Rise and H222 head to the elevator and enter Ticonderoga. This safe house Ticonderoga is named after Fort Ticonderoga in the real world. Fort Ticonderoga is an 18th century star fort built by the French. The word Ticonderoga is a Native American Iroquois word meaning between two waterways, the two waterways being Lake Champlain and Lake George. It had roles in the French and Indian War, the Revolutionary War, and it changed hands a number of times between the French, the Americans, and the British. Ticonderoga as a fort was notable for being, well, bad. It was too small for the style of fort it was trying to be. It was only about 500 feet wide and could only hold 400 soldiers. The buildings on the inside were too tall, making them susceptible to cannon fire. But the biggest flaw is that the fort was built on lowlands surrounded by taller hills which meant that besiegers who were atop these hills could simply fire down into it. And indeed, in 1777, when the British attacked the fort, that's exactly what happened. They took the hills above it, and even though the Continental Army was inside of it, they abandoned the fort because it was no longer safe. So this safe house is named after a fort that wasn't really safe. I certainly hope that isn't foreshadowing. Now at this point we could leave, but we can also use this opportunity to explore the safe house Ticonderoga. It's really the only functional safe house that we have an opportunity to explore, aside from the Mercer safe house. Heading up the elevator, we find a few railroad agents. Tycon's one of the few places I feel safe. Nice job with H2. Hmm. And ghouls? What? Oh! We ain't no easy pick. Okay, that's, uh, that's not supposed to happen. I'm not exactly sure what happened there. But I tried this again, and I didn't get swarmed by ghouls from the elevator. I don't even have any mods installed on this playthrough, so, yeah, I have absolutely no idea what that was, but... If things go according to plan, we arrive in Ticonderoga, we don't get swarmed by ghouls, and we can explore the place. Of note, there's a fat man launcher sitting on a crate underneath the staircase, and we're free to take anything we find lying around. There is a rubble ramp leading downstairs, but before heading downstairs, we can take the staircase in the middle of the room to explore what's upstairs. There's a cap stash on a dresser at this mezzanine level, and then we find two elevated rooms to the right and to the left. Heading to the right first, we find a barracks. We can sleep in either of these beds, and there's some minor loot in this room. Heading to the floating room on the other side, we find a hallway with a number of rooms flanking it. In one, we find an armor and weapons workbench. Incidentally, there's a mini nuke lying on a crate here. We find a fat man launcher and a mini nuke up here. Something to bear in mind for later. Crossing the hall, we pass high rise. Thanks again. The Commonwealth ain't safe at night. And in this room, we find a chemistry station and a chem box. At the end of the hall, we find a room to the right that has a copy of guns and bullets on a desk. Hell yeah. You've collected an issue of Guns and Bullets, Guide to Hunting Commies. Ballistic weapons permanently do 5% critical damage. Back to the hallway, and at the end of it, we find a room to the left. Here we find an expert locked terminal, and it's set to owned. We'll get in trouble if we're caught hacking this. There's a stealth boy on a shelf above the bed, and if we want to risk it, we can hack the terminal. Property of High Rise. Inside, we find two entries in the first tourist reports. The gentleman, maintaining loose surveillance, nothing new. That's gotta be old man Stockton. Big Cheese, being very careful, interactions with Red are suspicious. Strange hours being kept, definitely abnormal behavior. Separate report will be filed. Snowbird, breadcrumbs in place, needs Snowbird's code name from HQ. Would make it easier to track movements I got a theory. Tangerine, 
Wanna call it quits here. Relapse of chem addiction. All abnormality is explained. Almost certainly not an infiltrator. Jukebox. Well positioned. Plays it close to the vest. Confirmed two switchboard agents were there before lights out. Maybe dangerous to dig deeper. Suggest we avoid. And finally, Camper. Going to back up D. Camper's daughter is gone. All the signs point to an enemy job. Spoiling for revenge. Possible suicide risk. Need to move fast. We need new agents. I'm at a loss as to the true identities of these tourists. My guess at the gentleman being Stockton is just that, a guess. It could be that the camper is Old Man Stockton, because we learned from the quest at Covenant that Old Man Stockton lost his daughter. You can learn more about that by watching my video on Covenant here. Additionally, his codename is Camper, and Old Man Stockton camps at Bunker Hill. However, High Rise thinks that Camper is a possible suicide risk, and we didn't get that vibe from Old Man Stockton. Big Cheese could be Hancock, because he is the Big Cheese of Good Neighbor, and he does have close interactions with Fahrenheit, who is a redhead. Could Fahrenheit be red? The only problem with this is that High Rise talks about him suspiciously, but John Hancock is clearly not in the Institute's pay. Tangerine could be Cricket, for no other reason than that Cricket is clearly on chems. Though we learned from the Institute terminals that she was an Institute informant. So could Cricket be working both as an Institute informant and as a railroad tourist? Highly unlikely, but that's my best guess. And Jukebox could be Travis Miles. And if he is a tourist, then yeah, he is indeed playing it really close to the vest. However, the terminal also says that two of the switchboard agents met with Jukebox before the switchboard was raided by the Institute. Travis was not listed as an Institute informant in the Institute terminal entries, so I don't know. And I have absolutely no guess about Snowbird. If you have any theories as to the true identities of the rest of these tourists, let me know in the comments section below. And the next one, saved messages. HQ, don't get me wrong, G gets results, but this close to origin, we don't always need things shot to pieces. D's too busy, and besides, with all the nearby activity, I need a real heavy. What about TW? Someone new? That last job attracted half of Cambridge to our location. Advise. So, <laughs> High Rise is complaining about Glory's methods here. He discounted D, Deacon, because Deacon was too busy focusing on us. He then suggested TW, which must have been Tommy Whispers. So this was written before the loss of the switchboard. That's it for the top level. We can now take the rubble ramp to the floor below. Immediately to the right, we find an advanced locked wall safe with ammunition inside. There's a door to the right of the staircase that leads to a small supply closet with a first aid kit inside. And here we find a window overlooking the Commonwealth. It's a great view from up here. Out of this room and turning left, we find another room with a vault tech lunchbox inside and some minor scrap. There's also a Protectron control terminal here with one Protectron in its charging dock. Again, good to know for later. Heading out, we find a Nuka-Cola machine with a Nuka-Cola inside and we can take a rubble ramp downstairs to the next level below. Of note, beneath the staircase is a crate with two Nuka-Cola quantums inside. At the end of the hallway, we find a human skeleton lying on the ground. We can turn right or left. Heading left for now, we can open a bathroom door. We find some buff out in a sink. Turning back around, we pass H222. Yeah, I'm glad to be off the streets. Hey, H2. Is this the sort of place people live? And we can explore this final room over here. There's not much here, but a rubble ramp leading down to a further floor below. We see some windows in the eastern wall leading to a room with an end of dungeon steamer trunk inside, but we can't get in there from here. Instead, we need to turn around west and open this door to explore a room on the other side of an open security door. Here we find a door that leads to a long hallway. Behind one door in this hallway is a large toolbox. At the end of the hallway are a variety of rooms leading to a broken floor that we can use to drop down to the room below. But if we don't drop down and skirt this ledge a bit, we can get on the other side of that security door where we saw the end of dungeon steamer trunk. Inside the trunk is a bunch of ammunition. With this floor explored, we can drop down the hole. 
This level has a number of containers where we can take advantage of the scrounger perk and then a hallway lined with more rooms. Each of these rooms has a number of containers, nothing terribly interesting. There's a Nuka Cola machine with Nuka Cola inside. And at the end of the hall is one room with a terminal and a safe. Both the terminal and the safe are locked with expert locks. If we hack the terminal, we find an option to disengage the lock on the safe. And inside the safe, we find ammunition. At the end of the hall is a terminal that we can use to unlock a door leading back outside. On the other side of the door, we arrive at the top of a staircase. And taking the staircase down, we arrive at the ground floor of Ticonderoga, right next to the elevators. With that, we complete Boston After Dark, and we can head back to the railroad to see what they have next for us. And we'll pick up right here where I leave off in my next episode. I publish new lore videos each and every week on my channel, so if you don't want to miss the next one, be sure to subscribe and to click that bell notification button. If you have already, but you still feel like you're missing out on YouTube notifications, consider following me on Twitter at Oxhorn. I update Twitter manually with every new piece of content that I publish. I have a merch shop with completely unique designs that you can't find anywhere else. My designs come on shirts in a variety of men's, women's, and children's sizes, and in a wide array of colors. You can find them on other products as well, like smartphone cases, pillows, posters, mugs, stickers, prints, etc. So if interested, you can find a link to my shop in the description below, or you can click here. If you like what I do and you want to support me in another way, consider becoming a patron on Patreon or a member here on YouTube. YouTube members get little badges that appear next to their names in the comment sections of my videos, and they can use ox emojis in my video comments and in the live chats of my live streams. You can also consider giving me a super thanks on this video. Your super thanks directly contribute to the production of the series. But more than anything, I'm just so glad you're here watching this video with me today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you soon with more brand new videos and more live streams. Have a care. Odds are very good you're walking into something nasty. Uh-huh.